I'm Jim Carney. I'm Linda Hirsch. And this is EdCast, a program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. When it comes to electing an education mayor, New Yorkers will have some very real choices. Bill de Blasio and Joe Lotus seem poles apart on today's important education issues, their views diverging on almost every relevant topic. Today, journalist and City Limits reporter Helen Zellin joins me to discuss what she's learned about the candidates and what parents, teachers, and students can expect from each as the next mayor. As the stakes have increased, big money's flowing even more freely into the campaigns, the stakes for New York parents is also going up. Later in the program, we'll hear from the candidates themselves in one of their recent debates. But now, Linda and her guests in the studio. My guest today is Helen Zellin, journalist and reporter for City Limits, a New York City-based nonprofit news agency that does in-depth reporting on urban life and policy. Welcome to EdCast, Helen. Thanks so much. You recently did a wonderful article, I think, Thank you. comparing the two mayoral candidates, Bill de Blasio and Joe Loda, and their specific positions on education. Now, we know that Adolfo Carrion has obviously has some opinions on education. But I think for today, let's focus on the two front runners, de Blasio and Loda. And I thought what we might be able to do is look at their positions in education, one contentious topic at a time. Good. <laughs> so we thought we might begin by listening to the candidates themselves as they discuss some educational issues on their debate on ABC on October 15th. So let's take a look and see. Great. Uh, this is for Mr. de Blasio. Thousands of charter school parents, teachers, and students took to the street last week protesting your plan to charge charter schools rent for using public school property. They say that paying rent will put them out of business. What do you say to these 70,000 charter school students and their parents and teachers? Well, a couple of things. First of all, I'm a public school parent myself. I have been for the last 14 years. And that informs my whole understanding of what we have to do to help our children. 1.1 million New York City public school kids. Now, 95% of them don't go to charters. They go to traditional public schools. And I've said that's where my first focus will be. That's why, for example, I've called for a plan to tax the wealthiest New Yorkers, those who make a half million or more, so we can have full day pre-K for every child who needs it and after school programs for middle school kids. But as for charters, that 5% of our school system that's charters, I'll work with them. I've said it repeatedly. I've said I'll work with the charters that are doing a good job. They're including every kind of child. But those that aren't doing such a good job or aren't inclusive, I'll be tougher on them. I won't favor them the way the Bloomberg administration did. And by the way, as to the question of rent, I've said very clearly, you know, the nonprofit charters that don't have a lot of resources, I'm not going to charge them rent, but the ones that have millions of dollars of surplus, they have lots of private assets at their disposal, why shouldn't they pay some rent to help us out so we can run the best school system possible? The reason why charter schools shouldn't pay rent is because they are public schools and we don't charge our public schools rent, whether they're uh, a charter school or a regular public school. Bill de Blasio has changed his mind and has flip-flopped on this issue. During the entire Democratic primary, he said he was going to make sure that they were charged rent. Only now we get this nuanced difference. We need to make sure we know exactly where he stands. <laughs> But what's, mo what's even more important is truly understanding that he also wants to do away with co-location of charter schools. Charter schools, again, are public schools, and they absolutely deserve to be co-located. We've seen results that come out of the regular public schools and the charter public schools when they're co-located. All of them have rising grades. Look, we need to reform our entire public school system. Charter schools is just a small part of it. We need to make all of our schools excellent schools. Right, Mr. de Blasio, a very quick response. Yeah, this is right out of the Republican playbook. Mr. Loda is distorting the facts. I've said very clearly that we will charge uh, charters that have resources. We won't charge those that don't have resources. I've said very clearly we should have a moratorium on co-locations. You know why? Because public school parents don't have a voice in decisions about their own children and the building that their children go to school in. And they deserve that voice. When we get a system together that will actually give parents some rights, 
uh, that's when we can move ahead with appropriate co-location. So I'd like uh, my opponent to at least pay attention to the things I've said and accurately portray them. Mr. I have I have paid attention, Bill, to what you've said, and in, and during the entire Democratic primary process, you never made a distinction between the different types of charter schools. It was emphatic in saying no, and to you know to basically start throwing around saying I'm this or I'm that really doesn't help the debate. We need to talk to the people of New York about the issues. They certainly covered a great deal of ground, it seems, in that question about charter schools. Uh, is it too simplistic to say charter schools, de Blasio, no, low to yes? What's your take? Uh, two responses. I actually don't think they covered a lot of ground okay. in answering that question because they talked about rent. They didn't talk about the schools. They didn't talk about what's different between charters and traditional publics. And they didn't talk about how charters work for some communities and work don't work for some communities. So it's a much more... It's a much broader conversation. But if you're going to go broad stroke, mm -hmm. I think you can say low to yes charter, de Blasio no charter, or de, ba de Blasio questions charters and wishes to sort of rein in their growth. Truth is, there's a state cap on the charters, and you'd have to change the law to grow more could, charters. If you could apply to, if you, if you sure. wanted to. Sure, sure. What's interesting, again, this issue of co-locations has come up mm -hmm. repeatedly this year. It's been a very divisive issue in schools and in which charter schools are being placed into existing public schools and taking over some of the resources in the space. Uh, why do you think Joe Loda doesn't see this as such a problem, or he appears that he doesn't see this as such a problem? Joe Loda would like to put charter schools into Catholic school buildings that are not being okay. used by the diocese. He is he, he's a very market-driven guy. He has an MBA. He's a businessman and a manager. And there's, he, there are 50,000 people on charter waiting lists in places like Central Harlem. And from his point of view, there's, there's demand, so there should be a supply. The, the interesting thing about co-location is that uh, upwards of 40% of DOE schools are co-located and share a building with mm -hmm. another school. Might be, might be five high schools in one big mm -hmm. high school building or an elementary school and a middle school incubating on mm -hmm. an upper floor. But the conflictful part comes when it's a charter school being added into a traditional public school building and often that public school is being, off, being told by the Department of Ed to truncate grades, phase out, um, stop serving the local right. community. There's many things that come up just from your response, and that is there is a waiting list for charters. Yeah. And that there is no real compelling evidence that charters are making such a big difference in terms of student achievement. Right. What do you think, as a person who's investigated this for a long time, I've asked many people on the program, why the fascination with charters when there's no real compelling evidence? What's your take on that issue? You know, it's very interesting because charters are, in, in, the, in the sort of, sector of reforms, Bloomberg reforms, that, that sound good, but we don't have a real track record of results. What we know from charters is that some are good, some are terrible, most are in the middle. The, originally, 20 years ago in Minnesota, when the idea of charter schools came into being, they were seen as progressive labs for mm -hmm. urban education, places where people would try new ideas and new approaches, and that this would be, because it was a less constrained environment, this would be a place where best practices could mm -hmm. move out into mm -hmm. the traditional publics. But what we see in practice in New York is much more um, what people unflatteringly call drill and kill. Mm -hmm. In the charters, they are much more test focused and they work with younger teachers generally mm -hmm. who are not unionized and who work at the pleasure of the charter operator. So there's a mm -hmm. kind of churn, there's a much right. greater degree of turnover among teaching staff. I suppose if the results were dramatically different. We could even look at that pedagogy and say maybe it has some merit, but I'm not sure. But Do you know there are charters who work with kids on on, on character issues, things that they, right. that they talk about uh, bringing middle class values to different communities. And there are people who push back on that concept right. to say who is a, you know, that's very sort of paternalistic yeah. and um, it's, it's, a little, it's a little awkward. One of the things that both candidates seem to be in favor of is this concept of universal pre-K. Yes. And, um, and as we know, Bill de Blasio has said that he would levy a tax on the wealthiest New Yorkers to help pay for that. Governor Cuomo seems to be making pretty loud noises that he doesn't think he's going to be raising a tax. So what do you think is the reality of universal pre-K 
and can we pay for it? So it's interesting. Both de Blasio and Loda now say they're for universal yes. pre-K, gung-ho, let's go. <laughs> Loda says the money will come out of the budget. He's talking about 500 million, 550 million, which he says and, and is about a half a percent, one half of one percent of DOE's annual budget. So he says when he was budget director, he found that money anytime he reviewed the budget, and he's going to hire a budget director that's even better than he was. <laughs> that's how Lotus says he's going to handle mm -hmm. the money. De Blasio, interestingly and accurately, talks about raising the tax. Actually, the tax rise is to the point that it was when Mayor Bloomberg was first inaugurated. It's not a bump higher than what preceded, but it's higher than what people that's are paying now. De, uh, Lotus says, Lotus says that Cuomo told him it's dead on arrival in mm -hmm. Albany. Cuomo has said on the record he'll look at it. He'll look at it. It's anybody's guess, really. If they, I mean, it's really like scaling an Everest to think about selling a new tax in mm -hmm. Albany. But maybe there's a place in the middle if this is really a good goal for the city's children. And I, I personally think it is. All of the candidates that we've had on the program have all said when we ask about funding that the money's there, that the DOE just spends money in a not very wise way, and if they were the mayor, they would find that money. Right. The part of the de Blasio plan as well is this emphasis on after school programs mm -hmm. and a community based school. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Loda has that same concept as well? I think it's impossible to be against after school programs. I mean, that's sort of like them. being, paying for them is another story, but philosophically, nobody with a political bone in his body is going to come out and say, I really don't want to provide anything mm -hmm. for middle schoolers to do after school from three to six until their parents get home. Right. You know, there have been some people who've said as much as they support the universal pre-K, it really only, be it, it will really only benefit the future generations of students, but it doesn't do that much for the students who are in school right now. What do you say to that? I mean, well, I don't see anything wrong with benefiting a future generation. I think that that's a fine thing mm -hmm. to do. Um, the students who are in school right now will not be helped by pre-K. They're past it. Right. And this is where you get into the conversation the about money. the Common Core right. and increasing rigor in the schools and tra training teachers to teach to the mm -hmm. Common Core. And in a bigger picture, to look at almost a two-tiered school system where some schools exist to serve the least skilled kids and to bring them up to proficiency and a small layer of schools are more selective, higher performing and working with higher level kids and keeping them on a, on a, on a high achieving track. So unfortunately there, it's, not, it's not just one school system, there are two layers to it. And the kids who are in third and fourth and fifth grade now Nobody is really saying, none of the, none of the two leading mm -hmm. candidates are saying, here's my proposal to get these kids through middle school. We watch test scores climb, depending on how you measure them every year, but they rise during middle school, during elementary mm -hmm. school, and by eighth grade, they tank. They tank. So you bring up this very important issue of the achievement gap. Yes. And that is the fact that not only is performance in schools not really accelerating, but we know there is a gap between the, between the academic performance of white and Asian students and African American and Latino students. And both of the candidates were asked about the achievement gap on the debate, so let's hear what they said. I mean, it's another thing, nobody can be pro-achievement gap. Right? <laughs> this is, you know, nobody can, can say that they favor it. Can we, let, let's hear, but they, they address it in some way, let's see. Mr. Lora, as you know, we've had 12 years of mayoral control of city schools, and as you know, the so-called achievement gap has widened to the point that only about one out of six black or Hispanic students are passing the standardized English test, mm -hmm. while nearly white, half of white students pass, and we see similar results in math tests. So what will be your specific plan to close this achievement gap that we see today? Look, the achievement gap is something that's getting wider and wider each year, and we need to really focus on it. I believe we need to do it with the teachers. We need to provide our teachers with more resources, more training, and more understanding of what they need to do as teachers. Every teacher I've ever met has a strong desire to educate young minds. My responsibility as mayor is to give them the professional development and the training necessary to do their job. 
what happened with the core curriculum this year, implementing the core curriculum without the professional development, without the training, ends up with the scores that we've had. There's no reason in the world why it should have been implemented in, in the way in which it was, which was not rational and not the best way overall. As I said before, our schools deserve to all be excellent schools. I want to make sure that good teachers become great teachers, great teachers become excellent teachers. I might have to pay them more for the extra uh, professional development time, but it will be well worth it because the return on investment is to making sure that our children are prepared for the 21st century. Mr. de Blasio? Well, you know, I agree with my opponent that we have to focus more on support for teachers, teacher training and development. In fact, one of the biggest problems facing our city is teacher retention. Great, talented teachers who work for a few years and then don't want to continue in our school system. And we have to solve that with a lot of new approaches that will build up remote morale, give teachers a clear professional path forward and the support they deserve. But let's be very, very clear. Uh, the Republican playbook, and unfortunately we've seen it with uh, Mayor Bloomberg in recent years, is to attack teachers, to take away that morale. Uh, by undercutting the people we entrust with our children. If we really want to address the achievement gap, we need to start with early childhood education. That is the proven difference maker. We saw in this recent Common Core test how far we have to go. Let's invest in full day pre-K for every child in this city. That's how we will start to close the achievement gap we have now. Is that the answer? What do you think? Did either of them offer a solution to closing the achievement gap? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that the achievement gap, it's very, it's a little bit deceptive in some ways. It's easy to look at race and say white and Asian kids this, black and Hispanic okay. kids that. There are issues that are deeper and broader than a kid's skin color in this equation. Mm -hmm. A lot of it has to do with parental education and what a kid brings with them mm -hmm. coming to, to school on the first day, which goes to de Blasio's comments about universal right. pre-K. There's lots of academic work about the amount of language a kid is exposed to before they even speak, influencing their vocabulary, how they think, how they construct ideas, and how they communicate. Well, poverty seems to be a big Poverty factor. seems to be a big <laughs> factor. So saying that you're going to give teachers more professional development, great. But that, that begs the question. Teachers are, are operating in loco parentis. They cannot, a kid who comes to school hungry is not going to care too much about Andrew Jackson, you know? A kid whose parents are fighting and one has left the home and one is there, um, they may act out at recess in third grade, right? That may be a problem. So there are much more pervasive issues in the city that t it's, it is, I believe, an unrealistic expectation for teachers to fix. And it sets teachers up to fail. I think you bring up an interesting question, I think, and that is the climate toward teachers. If I were starting out now, I would never want to be a public school teacher, I think. Um, do you think either one of these candidates can make a difference in changing that dialogue and changing that atmosphere in that conversation well, for the better? I would, I would hope that given the strong support of the teachers union that uh, de Blasio might have a, a step up there. It's hard to know. The teachers are working without a contract right mm -hmm. now. They, had, they got a 43% raise under Mayor Bloomberg early in his first term. He also raised the level of rigor for teachers. Teachers now have to have master's degrees. They have to be better educated. They have to be, especially in the upper grades, well-trained in the Ex subjects right, that they teach. Right. Can, the, can a new mayor make a difference for teachers, the, a really ground-shifting difference for teachers? I don't know if it's, a, if it's enough of a difference if we don't address poverty and we don't address community issues that really affect kids' lives outside of school as well as in the classroom. We can say quickly that in passing when it comes to the issue of mayoral control, all the candidates want it. They want so it. So we, we can get over that one yeah. fast. They all want it. Yeah. Everyone has ever said they want it. So That's we can right. just move on from yeah. there. And that is parental involvement. They have all said they want parental involvement. But does anyone want it more, does anyone want it in a meaningful way besides, of course, come to school, we welcome you. Does anyone want to hear a parent voice on policy? Do you know, I think a lot of um, our current governor's father who said that you campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose, <laughs> right? Everybody wants parent involvement. Nobody's saying how. Nobody's saying how they're going to get it. They say, oh, we'll have town halls. Well, 
there's no, no one has articulated a real process. It's a great ideal. Again, you can't run for office and say we don't want to hear from parents. So there's a political calculation, I'm sure, on both, on both teams. But I really want the nuts and bolts, and I don't get it from either gentleman. You um, asked in your piece that you wrote, does anyone have a new idea? It's a good question. Does anyone have a new idea? And who? Uh, well, uh, there's an irony to that in my point of view. Neither of these two candidates that we're discussing today have a particularly radical new vision for the schools. However, one of the former candidates, uh, William Thompson, had a couple of ideas that I wish anyone elected mayor would put into his pocket and implement once in power. Which ones? In particular, we talk a lot about college readiness now, and this is a big focus from the state regents and a big focus of the mm -hmm. DOE, a lot of 9 to 14 schools that do early college, like the one that President Obama is mm -hmm. visiting mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. We don't have anybody from CUNY on the panel for education policy. There's no representative from college, from higher ed, in that body. There should be. Mm -hmm. And also, William Thompson proposed offering students who come into CUNY with a B average from high school free tuition for the first year. That's a tremendous mm -hmm. offer. Eighty percent of New York City high school graduates that go to CUNY need remediation. They have to pay for that remediation. They don't, it doesn't accrue to their degree. This would be a great, great gift to the students mm -hmm. who do come to CUNY prepared and ready to move forward. I do want to give John Lewis some credit as well because he really had a very comprehensive plan called Beyond High School to work with CUNY and to get students ready for college yes. in the high school years. And I have to say that he really had de a has comp an, an inter comprehensive report. He has an interesting uh, early high school plan with John Jay, possibly, to develop um, recruits for the police academy so that people would graduate from high school with an AA and right. either go to the academy so or go to So they're building on that school. existing idea already. We only have a minute left, oh. so I want to ask you quickly, um, who do you think each of these candidates might select as the new chancellor? Oh, wow. Any guesses or suggestions if you could tell them who to select? Uh, I would not presume <laughs> to guide these candidates. Okay. We have a lot of very intelligent, big brains on their teams. What we are seeing is a steady exodus of leadership from DOE out to the private sector and to other areas. So it's not known who will be remaining to Do you think promote. it'll be an educator? Or do you think that there's a back, is there, is there enough of a backlash now? I mean, do you think it'll be an educator? Uh, de Blasio has committed himself to appointing an educator as chancellor, and Loda hasn't been specific. He hasn't been specific. Uh, interesting, we touched on it very briefly. The UFT obviously is supporting de Blasio now. They did not initially. They supported Bill Thompson. That's right. Why do you think that was? I think that the UFT, first of all, Bill Thompson led the Board of Ed for five terms. He has very strong history with the educators in this city. And Bill de Blasio, you have to remember in the beginning of the primary, was really running as an outsider. Not much of a known quantity in terms of leadership capacity, and I think the UFT fed, felt mm -hmm. uh, more aligned with Bill Thompson. Any final words before we have to sign off and with Election Day coming up? I think that the city is at a tremendous opportunity point. We have a chance to elect our first new mayor in 12 years. 12 years is the amount of time a child goes to school in the public schools. This election can change the lives of a lot of children, maybe some of your listeners' children who are sending their children into the schools or have students. I would encourage people to vote. What, what is shocking to me is that 4% of people under 30 voted in the 2009 mayoral election. And if you want to complain about the mayor, you better go vote. Thank you so much for joining us. Helen Zellin, this was a really informative conversation. Thank you so much. Don't go away. We'll be right back with our Ed Bites. Welcome back to this edition of Ed Bites. A study reported by Inside Higher Ed backs up teacher perceptions that students are using digital devices in classes more than ever. They use them to text, check the time, email, social network, web surf, and even play games. According to the students, the advantage is staying connected and avoiding boredom. Not surprisingly, only 9% favor a ban on digital devices in the classroom. Greed is not good, then how can we prevent it? 
maybe by not majoring in economics. Wharton professor Adam Grant reports that economic professors and students are less charitable, more likely to deceive for personal gain, accept greed as good, and are less concerned with fairness. While the studies acknowledge a self-selection bias, the evidence indicates that just studying economics can make people more selfish. With business now the most popular major in the U.S., educators are calling for a change in economics education that, among other things, gives students broader exposure to the social sciences with its emphasis on concern for others. Education Week reports that contrary to what many have supposed, corporal punishment still exists in U.S. schools as a means of disciplining students. African American and male students receive a disproportionate share of this kind of punishment. There's no federal policy on corporal punishment, and its use varies state by state, with southern states using it the most. Teachers and students have some very different views on social media. According to students, Facebook is for old people. Both seem to like Twitter, if for different reasons. Each group uses social media platforms for different purposes. For example, teachers might use Instagram to take class photos, while students use it to post selfies. Teachers use Pinterest to plan lessons and meals, but students tend to see it as a toy for grown-ups. And both groups have Google Plus accounts, which they don't really use. You know, it's interesting. I actually have um, taken to digital devices in the classroom. Um, I encourage students to use their phones as long as they're not on Facebook or whatever they're but on. But you don't know what they're on. <laughs> well, I walk around the back and check. Good. But um, I challenge them to challenge me on a lot of statistics and facts, and as long as they don't use Wikipedia. Well, we can talk about that some other time. Not all bad, but okay. okay. That's it for this edition of EdCast. Until next time, class dismissed.